David Blue, Hello. I have been looking forward to talking with you for 13 years ago, SGU started. Oh God, <laughs> so much longer than it feels. <laughs> Okay, we'll leave the numbers out of it. The numbers are bad. Okay. But, Yesterday. Uh, yeah, I had a chance to visit the set before you premiered, and and we met Brian, and uh, got to see Destiny in person, got to see the gate, and uh, and then we went on this incredible ride that was over way too soon. Uh, so so I wanna, say we all. I want to talk about the show. I want to talk about Eli, but let's start with GateCon first year here, mm -hmm. uh, hanging out with fans in Vancouver. What what draws you to the conventions, and what's the experience like for you? I've actually wanted to do GateCon for a long time. They just, I, it's my first time getting invited. Uh, not only because I love doing conventions, I love seeing the fans, hanging out with the fans, seeing my fellow actors and artists and the background people, the crew and all of that, but I love Vancouver. I fell in love with this city pretty much midway through season two, just in time to get canceled. Just like I, to lose it. yeah, like I really, I think I said to somebody, I'm like, I think I'm going to live here forever. And then it was like, you got to leave. Yeah. <laughs> so doing GateCon where I get to see friends, have fun, talk about the show that we all love and also the city that I love, I couldn't pass it up. Now you were a science fiction fan, mm -hmm. and you had done sci-fi fantasy stuff before. We loved watching you on Moonlight, which mm -hmm. is another show that didn't go as long as it ought, ought to have. Is it me? Am I the reason the shows keep ending too early? <laughs> now it's an underappreciated genre. There you go. So you were a, a Stargate fan already mm -hmm. when, you got, when you got your audition? Would you tell us a little bit about uh, coming into this franchise as somebody who was already familiar with it and already loved it? Yeah, uh, I want to always clarify because I had seen all of SG-1 and all of Atlantis before I was ever cast, but to be completely like upfront about it, I had seen it kind of at first just by happenstance because it was always on in repeats and stuff. I wasn't watching when it was airing at first. Uh, it was just always on, and I would always catch it. And I ended up seeing all of the episodes because it was always on when I was like getting ready for work or coming home from school or something like that. And then by the time I think Atlantis came around, I'm like, oh, this is now destination television for me. Um, so much so that when I got the audition, I think I was in New York shooting my second season of Ugly Betty when they got me the audition for Stargate Universe, this new Stargate. And not only because it was another Stargate, but because of the character description, which I've said before, but sounded like McKay, I just remember thinking, I can't do this. I can't be more or better McKay than McKay. So I was going to pass on it. Really? I absolutely was. I mean, I want to work and I love what I do, but it felt like, I don't know what I can bring to this, you know? Um, I don't think I'm the right one for it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I talked to some of my friends who had been on the other Stargates, and they were just wonderfully raving about their experiences. And um, I decided to do it, and then I found out that the character description wasn't quite everything, and that the script was really good, and I just wanted to be on it. And it's funny, you know, uh, not to talk about the negative side of things, really, but the stuff that the people who never watched the show who hated on it <laughs> because they never watched the show, the reason they hated on it without seeing it were what drew me to it. Yeah. I had no interest in doing five more seasons of a show that was like SG-1 because SG-1 exists and it's great. I had no interest in you know, recreating Atlantis because Atlantis is great. So the idea of these creators of a show who made a franchise and a, to coin a term, universe that I love, expanding on it, telling new stories within it, trying to mix up the style a little bit, that was so exciting to me as an actor and as a fan. Like, I wanted to be part of that. If they came up to me right now and said, we're doing a whole new kind of Star Trek with a different spin, I would be in. But what was great about Universe is it wasn't even that. It was a gate, O'Neill, SGC, uh, you know, puddle jumpers, like everything, just with different people who weren't supposed to be there. And I loved the idea of risk and 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 
drama and tension and all of that. So all I needed was that, and I was in. And I wanted it so much so that I was worried I wasn't going to get it. <laughs> uh, and I, I loved it from, from day one, and it hasn't ended since. One of the things that the Stargate writers are so good at is, right, SG-1 starts with it's, it's us, it's the present day, mm -hmm. we're, we're just, we're out there in the galaxy doing our best, getting into trouble and, and trying to get out of it. But SG-1 got more and more competent and more and more powerful, we got alien tech, we got ships, and so now the challenge for the writers in the long term is dealing reversals. Mm -hmm. And SGU, you, the premise, the pilot, is the, the biggest reversal you can think of because you're in the middle yeah. of the ancient ship, but it's as, as the teaser says every week, it's the wrong people in the wrong place. You know, I don't, I hate retelling things that were told to me or anything like that, so forgive me for quoting or probably misquoting, but the way that I think Brad put it was amazing. When I, I think when we first started, or even when I was just up for the role, I think I asked him, like, why, why are you doing this? You know, like, I loved SD1, I loved Atlantis, why are you doing this? And he said, by the time we were on season like 12, of SG-1, they were superheroes, right. you know? Like, exactly. and I agree as a fan watching it, there are certain things you watch that you're like, they're gonna figure a way out of this. They always do and they will. And it's nice and it's comforting and it's fun and it's still great. But at a certain point it's like, okay, they're always gonna win. And Brad sort of alluded to, we wanted to see what would happen if we weren't sure that people were going to succeed. And again, I love that. I love the idea of not knowing. Um, like I auditioned for the, the lead of a big Star Wars-y type movie, <laughs> and, like prequel, and you're like, I know you survive because you're in the next movie. Right. And I always joke that there's no risk. Like, we're about to die, you're like, it'll be fine. <laughs> there's no risk. And you know, I love Michael Sheggs as a, as a buddy of mine, but like Daniel Jackson got to the point where he was Superman. You're like, you'll just come down, you'll snap your fingers Thanos style, and everyone will be gone. So to have a, a group of people that you don't know how they're going to come out the other end excites me, you know? Even as a fan viewer nowadays. Not to go off on a tangent, but it is funny. It, it really is true. The things that people who never watched the show and didn't know, really, um, anybody who was hesitant, were the things that I think drew everyone involved to it. Whether we were fans like me or not, like some of the others, it was great characters, a really compelling, interesting story, beautiful sets, amazing special effects. Um, the only nerves I think a lot of us had going in who were aware were the fans. There was this worry of, ooh, are they gonna like us? And that was before we even knew anything else, you know? It mattered to us. We wanted to expand the family. Yeah. That was always the goal. Yeah. And I still think we did. We started talking with Brad and Rob, you know, our annual pilgrimage to Bridge Studios. We started talking with Brad and Rob probably 2006, 2007 about the next spinoff mm -hmm. and what they wanted to do. and. I, I think we were the ones who broke the news that they were going to call it Stargate Universe, and they had no idea what it was going to be about, but, mm -hmm. but they had the name. And uh, I remember, it must have been 2008, because they weren't working on the show actively yet. You weren't in production yet. And I said to Brad, I mean, it's got to be different enough that it's not just a copy-paste of the same show, mm -hmm. but it also has to be similar enough that it it's Stargate and you're gonna bring along at least most of the fans and he said, you're exactly right. Yep. I feel like the show did that in mm. spades, yeah. but it was a different show and it was a different show <clears throat> in part because uh, those guys also wanted to write a different show. They didn't wanna write 10 more seasons of the same stuff. This is, you know, I don't wanna to speak too much on the negativity of it all too much because God knows it's been spoken about enough, although yeah. there's a lot of misinformation and, and one plea I will make to fans or anybody who loves or claims to love Stargate is seek it out. I've, I've answered in bevy of interviews and posts, and I even did a live stream of it a few months ago to re-answer the questions and the facts. There's a lot of misinformation and people still believe it, and I really wish they'd find out what the truth of it is. But the thing I'll always say to anybody who back then had a problem with even the concept of a new type of show, it's the same people who created the thing you love. 
So first of all, give it a shot. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they literally made what you love. You can't crap on it if they made the thing you love. Mm -hmm. But also, they've done it now for 15 plus years, technically. They're gonna wanna do something different. They don't wanna just keep doing the same thing. And I respect the heck out of that. Today, on, on uh, social media before the convention, I'm like defending the show 10 plus years later when people try to say things like, oh, it's not Stargate, or it, you know, Discovery's not Star Trek, or something like that. Yes, it is. First of all, because it's in the name. <laughs> Secondly, it's in the universe. All, that's all it needs. But even more than that, you have, you know, let's use us for an example. You have O'Neill. You have the world, the history, the everything exists. I always liken things not to compare to like Star Trek. I love Next Gen. I started watching Deep Space Nine. I sort of watched Voyager. I didn't really watch Enterprise. Yeah. There were some that were for me. There were some that weren't, which is fine. But as I've gotten older, I've rewatched them, and I love them all for different reasons now. They're different stories around the campfire that take place in the same world. And I think there's room enough for that. And I loved Universe as a fan. Like, it's, they did experiment with new things, and they tried different kinds of storytelling, and I found them fascinating. Mm. There's a reason we as a cast got together every night and watched it live together as it was airing. Because we weren't just in it, we liked it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I meet them here at the con and all sorts of other places. There are so there are millions of people who liked and love it now, and I think that shows that it did something great. And you millions know? more who are discovering it after the fact. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many how many emails and comments I've fielded through GateWorld are, are you know SG yeah. was my show. I came to Stargate through SGU. You know it's wild, and I, I worry that any of it seems like hyperbole because it's not. It's been. Shmur, 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 years. <laughs> I get an email, a DM, or a comment a day asking, I just finished watching it, what happens in season three? I get, you know, I, you can't leave me hanging like this. Yeah. Nonstop. Yeah. And I think that shows that we not only touched on something great, but that it was, it was quality, it was good, you know? Mm -hmm. To be honest, I don't even think I need to defend it anymore, because I don't think it ever needed to be defended, but I do love to sing its praises. I respect the hell out of behind and in front of the screen, everybody involved in it, before us and on our show. The stories they were telling were amazing. Uh, we would get the script. It was so funny. I don't know if you've heard this before. We would be filming on set. A new script would get emailed to us, and everyone would scatter like roaches with the lights turned on, because they'd find corners, and everyone would just be like reading the scripts, trying to see what happens next. And we were the cast. You know, yeah. like that's how good it was. And, and that's why Ben Browder reached out to me. And he's like, I want to be on this show. That's why when Robert Nepper came on, he's like, I'm so happy to be here. This show's great. It was a fun place, but it was also, it was good work. And it's, I've rewatched it recently. It holds up a decade later. That's a sign that it's pretty freaking cool, you know? Yeah, it not only holds up, it in a lot of respects was ahead of its time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, again, Testament to Brad, Rob, Carl, Joe, yeah. uh, Andy, <laughs> uh, Ron, everybody. Yeah, but the Stargate is the ultimate vehicle for storytelling. Mm -hmm. And going into a very different kind of Stargate show, a Brad Wright script is a Brad Wright script, and it's going to be a banger. Mm -hmm. Carl Binder script and a Joseph Malazzi script. Yeah, they're fantastic writers. They're so good at what they do. When you give them different tools and let them stretch different muscles. Yeah. All of the creatives involved in the thing were just killing it. Everyone's like the top of their game. They're just like absolutely, I mean, every single time you would have, I, I remember uh, yesterday, I was in the dealer room here at the con and somebody had like, oh, this is an actual chip used on set that we're like gonna sell. And it lit up and it looked crazy cool. And I'm like, look at the detail they put into a thing that probably no one saw. Oh yeah. If there's anything I've learned over and over and over again with fandom, let alone Stargate, is they're wonderfully supportive and, and there, you know? Conventions like this remind me that. I remember when we were premiering at San Diego Comic-Con for the first time, and we had already heard some rumblings that some people were hesitant about a new series and all that stuff, but we were having a blast because we had filmed a bunch 
And Ming-Na and I were backstage at Hall H, which is the biggest hall at right. Comic-Con. And I think she said to me, I just hope anyone's here. And I was like, yeah, me too. Like, I don't know, like, just give us 100, 200 people. And we walked out and it was 7,000, it was sold out. Oh yeah. And we're like, oh, cool, okay. <laughs> you never know how big the audience is gonna be, yeah. you know? But without fail, the Stargate fans show up. Yeah. Great fans. Um, let's spend some time talking about Eli because I, sure. he didn't get a full story. He didn't get the, the entire arc that Brad and Rob have in their heads. But uh, we got 40 episodes. We got two years with this guy, and he changed and he grew. Mm -hmm. Talk about and shrunk. <laughs> and, well, you posted uh, recently about how he literally shrunk as part of that journey. So tell us about Eli's journey over the course of those two years. Uh, I loved it, beginning to end. Uh, you know, they 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 kept their cards close to the chest about what was going to happen. They wouldn't often tell us like where things were going unless we hounded them. Um, poor guys. And I just knew going in, they made it real clear to me that Eli was going to be a fish out of water. He was going to be the audience surrogate, yeah. which is a lot of pressure to put on an actor. But he's like, you're them. Uh, you are somebody who doesn't know that Stargate exists, jumping in. I kind of took it as I am my family who hadn't watched Stargate. It was like my responsibility to make sure they would understand what was going on. You know, not that I was rewriting or anything, but the performance of it, to be an access point, if you will. And the way they wrote him was great. He didn't really want to be there, even though he was excited about the prospect. Um, he didn't really know what he was doing. He was just kind of uh, a tool that people needed to use. And, and he was chasing others around. And, and um, how did I phrase it the other day? He looked at Young. He's like, oh, you're in charge. OK, cool. And Rush, you know more than me. OK, cool. Yeah. And then as time went on, what I loved about the way they wrote him and what I loved about performing in him is he started realizing their flaws. Like a kid growing up and realizing your parents aren't infallible. Mm -hmm. He started seeing that maybe Young doesn't make the right choices all the time. He started seeing that Rush has ulterior motives, but also maybe a good heart. And what I loved in season two is he sort of came into his own saying, you know what, if you're not gonna do it, maybe I need to. Maybe I can. Maybe I can and maybe I need to. Actually, there you go, the breakdown for Eli was something along the line of uh, acerbic sense of wit and untested wunderkind, the untested part. And I think two years on Destiny tested him. And by the end, you know, there's a little bit of, I, I don't want anyone else to risk themselves, let me do it. But I also think there's a bit of, I don't trust that you will, I think I will. And I loved that. I loved the growth and I always quote the the scene with Carlisle that sticks with, with, with Rush, sorry, that sticks with me where, where Rush says, you know, you've come a long way since you were that video game slacker I met. And Eli says, you've been pretty much the same. <laughs> I love that <laughs> so much. Because it's exactly how I saw his journey. You know, like he, he didn't grow into perfection or anything like that, but he grew into the confidence of being able to want to try and thinking he could maybe, you know? The way that I heard this dynamic described between Eli and Rush I don't know if it was the producers who, who gave us this, this image, was Mozart and Salieri. I love that. And uh, Rush <coughs> was dealing with his, his resentment of the fact that he was not, that Rush himself was not Mozart. Yeah, and it started on episode was. one. There is literally a problem and he can't solve it. Yeah. The minute you meet him, he hates me for doing something he couldn't do. And he wants to co-opt you as a tool to get what, where he wants to go. Yep. But by the time we get to Blockade and Gauntlet, just as you said, Eli has not only realized that he can do it, but he needs to be the one to do it. Forgive my bad memory, but like, I, I, which episode was it? Uh, I remember right when Young leaves Rush on a planet, that's the first like, that's a choice that I, I don't like him, but that seems like an overreach. And then there started to be like at him asking him to do this for him, spy on him, do this. These little yes, moments yeah. where you're just like, I don't know if you're a good person after all, you know? And I, those are what excite me as an actor, but also just playing the character of Eli that I, that I loved so much, the changes in the relationships. And, and to be honest, I think that's a testament to the writers. They started, part of that, that uh, stretching they wanted to do was instead of, these are the people in different situations, 
it was what television has sort of grown into nowadays, which is watch these people evolve and change. You know, Sons of Anarchy, like he's this and then he grows into that. Breaking Bad, he's this and he grows into that. It's what audiences seem to want to watch nowadays. And the creators were a bit ahead of their time in that. Because I for sure see different characters in episode 40 than I saw in episode one, 100%. And you go back and watch it, and you you know the journey that someone like Eli has gone on, or someone like Volker has gone yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. And it changes the way that you watch the show and appreciate the performances. Yeah, for good or bad. You know, some people take a bad journey, some people good. But I that's what makes stories interesting: is the unexpected, the change, the growth, the the hero's journey or lack thereof, the failure. That's what I think excites us all about the stories, and we always want to hear new stories. You know, I think they did a good job of it. What do you think we would have seen? Or I know you don't know the answer to that. What do you hope we would have seen in terms of Eli's growth in the third season? I can't answer that. I can't answer that because, to be clear, as I said on the panel today, it's not like I know everything. I don't have like a script for the finale or something like that. But I was lucky enough to be privy to some information about where it was going, what was happening, and I'll never say it. As I said on the panel yeah, today, a bit. I'll say it on. I said on the panel today, and I'll say it again. The reason I'll never say it is twofold. Number one, it's not mine to say. Yeah, it's Brad and Rob's story. Yeah, they wrote it. It's theirs. I, as a fellow writer, producer, and also just a, I would hope a good human being, um, it's not my place to reveal someone else's creativity. Secondly, uh, if I say it, they'll never do it because everyone's heard it. Mm -hmm. So if I keep my mouth shut, maybe someday, <laughs> you know. Uh, but it, it kind of wraps up into that. Uh, where it was going, where it was evolving, and pieces and stuff. Uh, but I will say this. I was always excited by, and looking forward to, since we were canceled unexpectedly, uh, looking forward to seeing what happened next, how his confidence grew, um, desperately hoping his heart would mend in a way where he would figure things out since he found a soulmate and then very quickly lost her. Yeah. And I was looking forward to him growing up and coming into his own, you know? It's, it's so inside baseball, so it's weird, but it's a strange thing as an actor, especially when you get to play a role over a while. There are parallels and big, huge differences, but they teach you as much as you inform them. And, and that's definitely true with Eli, especially as, it, as he changed. I was sort of changing too, in different ways, but, the, but in parallel. Um, so I was kind of looking forward to more of that. Uh, the, I joked with Brad, <laughs> I think second to last week of filming. You know, I, I intentionally lost weight from day one of filming. That was my choice. I asked Brad, Rob, Carl, and Joe, and they 100% supported it. They loved the idea because it made sense. We're on a survival show. Right. Also, for my own personal David Blue health and, and stuff, I wanted to live longer and feel better. Right. Um, so I did. And so I joked with Brad about two or three weeks before we finished, and I was like, I have a pitch for season three. <laughs> and he's like, Jesus Christ, what? Uh, and I said, okay, so they're all asleep in their stasis pods. They wake up three years later. Nobody can find Eli. And they're like, he's got to be here somewhere because we're all still alive, right? And they just go room to room to room, and they can't find him anywhere. And they finally get this one room, and they open it, and for no reason, fog pours out of the room. It's just like they can't see anything. Finally, it clears, and they just see this person doing pull-ups. You just see their back. Just I wasn't even remotely fit at the time, but I was just like doing pull-ups, and then drops down and turns with like a peg leg, a gun, maybe an alien on his shoulder, patch, and he goes, it's been a long three years. Like, I just... I liked this idea that you see him and he's different. Like, what happened? Um, we never got to do that, which was funny, but that's why like that hiatus between what would have been two and three, I started working out even harder. Because I just liked the idea of, ooh, what now, you know? Plus I hated that like Smith and everybody would be going on jogging scenes in the show and I was like never in a workout <laughs> yoga. That's all I got to do. I'm like, where's Eli while you guys are all working out together? Yeah. <laughs> He did, he did grow, he did evolve, and he came into his own in, in a way that was satisfying. Like the, the rest of Gauntlet, the series finale, is it's not enough, but it's, it's satisfying and it's a beautiful finale. Mm -hmm. It really is. And Eli's last scene is a, a testament to the, the beauty of where the character has gone. So I'm not trying to get any, no, any, anything out of you, but would you say that Eli's journey is tied to Destiny's journey in some sense? 
Uh, well, first of all, if I may say, none of us expected Gauntlet to be the end. Right. I don't think anyone knew it was going to be. Um, they were very good with the show about like kind of putting a semicolon at the end of every season. But uh, it was not meant to be the end. <clears throat> I don't want it to be the end. I didn't want it to be the end. But I think it weirdly served well. I've said over and over, people are like, I hate it, I hate it. I'm like, eh, it's kind of cool in a way because it puts it in the audience's hand. It became a choose your own adventure. What do you think happened next? Especially with the whole like three years or more. Like, is it gonna come back? Is it happening right now? What's going on? I loved that because it made people's imaginations spark. So in a way, I kind of loved it. I'd love to be doing more. I'd love to be filming right now. Yeah, but the fact that they're out there, yeah. they're in a void, they're frozen. Yeah. It's, it's a, a pregnant pause. Yes, and I will defend. And everyone's like, did Eli? It, Eli's awesome, come on. Come on. Uh, but to go back to your question, Remind me what the question was. <laughs> I forgot the question. Is Eli's journey in some oh. sense tied to Destiny's journey? Yes, and that's actually partially why I loved the, the Eli of it all, because he, he wasn't supposed to be here. He was supposed to, I don't know, go to some other college, get some lame degree, or you know, get a, get a part-time job or something like that to take care of his mom. And then instead, he got kidnapped in his last Starfighter fate. And from that moment on, could you let that go? If right now, this is a huge nerd test and I'm about to fail. If right now I disappeared and reappeared on the bridge of the Enterprise and Picard is like, we need you. I'm like, goodbye everything, let's go. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's what happened to him. I'm on a spaceship making a difference, making new friends, living life, learning things, figuring things out. How do you go back to anything after that? So wherever it ended up going, I think it's tied to the destiny. I think it's tied to the, the gate system, to the to space, to aliens, 100%. It's in his DNA. He just didn't know it until he met them, you know? Big Finish just recently brought back, they got their license <clears throat> renewed and brought back some of the Stargate audio projects, hmm. uh, which they had kind of wrapped up before SGU got their chance to tell stories. But here's, here's an example of another venue where we could, we could tell stories. Would you be interested in revisiting Eli in some form? I would. You know, I'm really weird about it, and I don't know if people know, and I always feel bad. Because I do write, I produce, I direct, and all these things. But going back to the like ownership of creativity, I love every fan fiction out there. I love every idea of continuation. But to me, especially knowing the little bit that I do about where they were maybe headed, if Brad and Rob aren't involved, it's not it. It's not canon. It's not fair to say that because Star Wars, Star Trek, all these other things that exist, eventually someone else picks up the baton, as it were. So I'm not saying that can't happen, sure. But as long as they're there, let alone maybe trying to do more, I feel like it's stepping on toes. So I'm always hesitant to participate in anything that says what happened or speculate what happened, yeah. or anything like that, because it feels like I'm stepping on the toes of what actually happened. If you did a project like that, it would it would have to be a self-contained Eli story that's not like an alternate season three or somebody else's yeah. version of Brad and Rob's story. You know, actually, that's that's a nice that's a better way to put it. I love acting. I love what I do. I love the characters I've played. So I'm always down to have fun and play, and, and I love working. <laughs> and when people have asked me before, I, I'm not going to lie, so people have reached out to me and they're like, I'm making a fan film, will you be in it? And I always say, no. Not because I don't want to be in a fan film, because I don't want to step on the toes of what would have actually happened, or yeah. may happen, not yeah. would someday. Um, so with the whole self-contained thing, it's the same caveat I tell them. As long as it doesn't speculate about what happened to the crew of Destiny or anything about wrapping anything up or anything like that, of course. But the problem is it always, it's always that. Now, if Brad and Rob and Carl and Joe reached out to me in the next four seconds and said, hey, we want, I'm like, yep, let's go. Because I'll tell you this, having interviewed the entire cast of SGU and most of SGU in Atlantis, um, I've asked them all, because I get asked all the time, would you do more? Every single one of them said, of course. Every single SG-1 person I've talked to is like, I want us all to be together. 
Um, I haven't talked to everyone from Atlantis, but 99.9% .9 are like, yes, let's do it. We all love each other, we love the characters, and we love the stories, so to revisit them is like a blessing. You know what I mean? Boy, to get Brad's movie that he was planning mm -hmm. for some sort of combined crossover rescue of the Destiny crew. Let me tell you, I feel like, just like the fans, when we got canceled, so most of us were on hiatus, so like we had a two month break. Yeah. So I went back home, which was Los Angeles, and uh, all my stuff was in Vancouver. And then uh, we're like, well, see you in two months. And uh, then we suddenly get canceled. We find out on Twitter, you know? And I think I messaged Brad on some social media. And I said like, hey, is there, is there like a, any maybe not to this? Cause like all of my stuff is in storage in Vancouver. Like, do I need to move? What's happening? And he said something, I think I still have it. He said something along the lines of like, no, wait, I'm working on something. And I got my hopes up so hardcore, not just as an actor who wanted a job, but because I was like, ooh, more. Like, we loved coming to work. So then when that fell through yeah. or didn't happen. This was the, let's see if we can take the show somewhere else. Let's yeah. see if we can get Apple. And he do. told me very similarly, like, what he was thinking of doing. And I was like, yes, I want to play with Michael Shanks and Ben Browder and Claudia and, and, and Amanda. Ah, bring it, you know, and Hewlett. Oh, my God. Yeah. It was exciting. And... Uh, I don't know. It's, it's unfortunate, because I think that alone, fans would have lost their minds. It would have been so much fun. Uh, For sure. But, I mean, more than a decade's gone by now. Is this sweet memories at this point? I mean, not the cancellation, but... I mean, yes and no. look back on the experience. During the pandemic, I mean, we were already friends, but during the pandemic, I sort of started having, like, monthly phone calls with Ben Browder. Um, I'd just be walking around my neighborhood, and we'd just be on the phone talking, and... We would every once in a while talk about Stargate and talk about like, uh, you know, we all know things that we might not, we're not supposed to know. Talk about like what he's pitching and what he's trying to do and really talking about, and, and always again, it comes down to like, God, it'd be fun to be in it with each other, wouldn't it? Like it'd be cool to do things with each other and wouldn't it be cool if this happened? Same thing with Robert Picardo, Connor Trenier. Uh, it's sweet memories because in a weird way, it, it didn't end. Like, not only our specific Destiny story is like, they're, they're up there somewhere doing something. <laughs> um, but we're all still friends. We all still talk about it. When you do conventions, it still lives on. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's not sad in a way. It's not about, to be clear, it's not about like you can't let it go or something like that. It's, it's like looking back at any wonderful experience and being glad it happened and just enjoying the memories of it. You know? I have a Kino in my house. So it's cool to look at it. Doesn't make me sad. The only thing that makes me sad is that it's over. Yeah. Hopefully for now. But that it ended. You know. Not. What is that quote? Don't be sad that it ended. Be happy that it happened. Mm. That's what I try to hold on to. Yeah. Because life's too short not to. Yeah. Why? What do you think happens? What would you want? You're interviewing me now. Yeah. <laughs> you don't interview an interviewer. You're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Look at this convention. How many people are here supporting a thing? If they were here for SG-1, how long ago was that? Yeah. And they're here, yeah. dressed up, getting autographs, having costume competitions, selling and or buying props. I hosted a panel yesterday, and I said at the end of it to the actors who were on stage, Stargate is special to us. For some people that just watch it, it's, it's a cool TV show. But we come from all over the planet and spend a lot of money to come to conventions like GateCon and invest our time and our money and our passion because it matters to us. Because mm -hmm. somehow it got under our skin mm -hmm. and it became a part of us. I, huge nerd, have watched everything, but I had a Star Trek The Next Generation birthday party, how to host a mystery birthday party when I was I younger. To My friends and I would watch the shows and immediately hop on the phone and talk to each other about the episodes and what we thought and what was going to happen next. I went to my first convention ever because I begged my dad to bring me to a Star Trek convention in my uh, small town where I was growing up. And it was my first time seeing TV film actors and getting their autograph. Uh, I entered a raffle. I was not old enough to drive. But I entered a raffle to win a car that had the entire cast airbrushed on the front of the Trans Am. And the, the gear shift was like a woo -woo warp core. And I was like, I want it so bad. Like, and that was, that's still me. So to then be a part 
of that. To be on the other side of the table all of a sudden, it means the world to me because I remember that. I remember what I wanted yeah. when I was that. And, and you I, wear that for an 11 year old somewhere. I hope, I try. You know, that's why I'm exhausted at cons because I'm like, it's my job to provide that. Um, but also, I remember that feeling. Star Trek The Next Generation changed who I am now. Hearing Barkley say, I, I plan to go to a party and talk to everybody, and then when I get there, I talk to the plant. I'm like, that's me. It made me feel less alone. Um, it made give me stuff to aspire to. And Stargate did that for countless people. I've met them, even the ones uh, for SG-1 in Atlantis. But every time I meet one who says that about universe, it, I don't know how to describe it. It's like icing on the cake. I'm an actor. I got paid to do a job. I enjoyed the job. I made friends. That alone is amazing. Yeah. The fact that I also maybe touched some people's lives and left a mark, you can't even like quantify that. Well, from the fans, SU fans especially, thank you. Because it matters to us. It's it nice. Really does. Thanks. It, I appreciate it. I, it. It's weird. <laughs> it's weird because I want to say thanks. You know what I mean? Like, I, as an actor, I do what I do because of the audience. Without an audience, what do we do? We're just crazy people who talk to ourselves. <laughs> but with an audience, it's, it's fun. And you can sometimes make a living <laughs> doing it. It's, it's wild. So it, seriously, thank you. And, and to all of the fans, I, I don't think I can communicate. I can just say from SGU, we looked at the Twitter as we were premiering to see what everyone thought until I told them not to. We read the message boards. We, I immediately wanted to do cons to see what was going on and have discussions about it and all of that. It matters. Um, it may not directly influence storylines. I mean, you know, it's entertainment. It's, there's no ownership. And I think that's something that fandom nowadays has to kind of work on a little bit. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. just talking about Stargate. I'm talking about like fandom. But it's for fandom. You know, they are the audience and they're very important and it wouldn't happen without them. And I hope they realize that. What are you doing now? Where can we find you? What can we look for you in next? Well, there's been a bit of a pandemic going on. Uh, uh, actually, it's been quiet because the whole industry shut down for you know two years. Uh, what have I done recently? So I am a villain on a kid show I've been for a little bit. Uh, Henry Danger and then Danger Force. I'm the bad guy, which is kind of fun, having right played on. the nice guy for so long. Mm -hmm. Had a bunch of movies. Everything from a Christmas movie to a rom-com to a World War II uh, historical kind of thing to a horror movie to a thriller. Um, what's next up on the plate? I honestly don't know. I've actually been writing and producing and directing and teaching a lot. I started a Twitch stream for David Blue during the pandemic kind of to keep myself sane yeah. and discovered a wonderful community of people that I not only play games with but also interview people, Ming-Na, Amanda Tapping, um, Ben Browder, <laughs> and uh, interview people and chat and stuff like that. Julie McNiven, who played Gin and I, started six years ago. We just discovered we had a lot of stories we wanted to tell. And we got coffee one day, and we have now written three pilots that we're trying to take out. One sci-fi, one period, one fantasy. Uh, Developing a few features with some other people, producing some stuff. Might try to produce something with Elena. We were just talking about it today. Nothing coming up that I can talk about, sure. but I love what I do and I'm not going Excellent. anywhere. <laughs> we're excited to see what's next. Yeah, and I think all of us kind of view, you know, we might not have all read the script, but I think all of us view Stargate as like this red bat phone off in a corner. If it rings, we're coming.